I bid you good day. We begin this topic with an exploration of a subject that in some ways has been considered mythical, a little of the folkloric of the ancient mysteries, and as well in your modern times as what you would consider your science fiction. Of course, the topic relates to all of these and to none of these, as we will soon discover. I have purposely decided to introduce the subject to you of my own accord without the channel's assistance, for I wished to unfold it for you gracefully that you would see all of its aspects. And now I will tell you that we begin to explore aspects of a dark magic of sorts of a fascination that humanity has with what is on the other side of the veil that could be considered of a darker nature. Where is the power of the darker aspects? What is its status? And why is it celebrated? And now I will tell you that, of course, the name that this topic would go under is that what you would typically consider a vampire, as if for the topic to unfold. And of course, to place you at ease, I will say to you that there is indeed no such creature, no such thing, not as it is depicted in your common time, nor as it was depicted long and longer ago. And yet, it is a subject itself that is older than time, not only upon this world, but on other worlds as well. And so we must ask ourselves, why? What is it of this subject that is fascinating to humanity, that it continues to live on in story and myth? Well... In some ways, it has to do with your unconscious. And it is the unconscious that goes, well, ignored to some degree. And because it goes ignored, then it must find another way to surface. In essence, it finds its way in and through every culture, and it finds a voice. And so your unconscious, conscious then, whether it is a fear of the unknown or the beyond the veil, or a fascination with it, finds a voice, its visual quality, and even if it is illusion, it comes forward. Now in the modern time, if you will look upon your own image in a mirror, and of course you may wish to erase a few of the lines that give you character, a few of the extra pound or two or imperfection that you may find in your image, well, now you have the true image of the vampire today. For if you will see its modern imagery, well, it is very strong, it is very youthful, very handsome or good-looking, seductive and strong, intelligent and, of course, even eternally youthful. And so that is the modern imagery. And, of course, to the young hearts and young minds, it seems so very attractive, and to others as well. And so they imagine, can it be so? If I sell my soul to the dark side, if I sell my integrity, what is it worth? Is it worth a good-looking eternity? What value does it have? And so the unconscious explores the value of your integrity, of your imagery, and of all that is held important in the world of the mundane. 
And why are we exploring this subject then? It is important to say, oh Gaia, how many wonderful and spiritual subjects are there to explore? Well, this one is as well, because it goes unspoken particularly upon the folk that will consider themselves of highest category and highest integrity. But you see, when you are not being in your highest truth, where are you? When you are not living to your highest ideals, where are you? When you are exploring the ideas of your culture, the accumulation of wealth or beauty or the holding of your eternal image, the rejuvenation. There is a part of you that finds this is well, well to do, well to consider. And there is a part of you that says, oh, well, that is a very vain thought or that is a very mundane thought. And I had better turn my thoughts to more spiritual concerns or to upholding my integrity or to making the world a better place. And because you do not allow yourself to consider the lower thoughts or the lower motives, because you truly believe that you have outgrown these in many ways, well, your subconscious continues to consider them and to compare itself against them to see where it fits. And you see, it must do this. It cannot truly consider only that which is of the light or of the sun, for then your beingness, truly your eternal beingness, would fall more into chaos, more out of balance. So that you do not consider this, your unconscious self does consider all of the qualities and always has. So it is not so much a part of human nature. It is a part of nature itself. It is a part of the nature of the earth. And each dimension has its own way to consider this. It considers the darkness as an extension of itself or of dark matter and to those that were uninformed long ago, dark matter and dark magic, well, it was similar, we will see. And so we begin to consider the topic. Now, of course, you may approach it as you will. I will give to you the guidance that the best way to approach this topic is to allow yourself to truly consider the more mundane aspects of nature, Without calling it the frailties of human nature, it is simply a part of nature itself. And these beings, as they are, as they are interpreted, whether in folklore or myth, or the aspects of them that can be considered real, they are part of you as well. They are a part of humanity. They are part of humanity's thoughts. You share your world with light and dark, with the finest minds, with the highest ideals, and with some of the lower vibrations as well. Oh, we will say that then this theme has two factors associated with the popularity. And one is the representation of sexuality. And another is Another aspect that we will simply call mortality. Whether or not you believe in your mortal self, what part of you continues to live or live on beyond the body's existence in the third plane. And again, I will say to you that though you may think the subject itself a bit of illusion, a flight of fancy, a little bit of folly, I tell you otherwise. I tell you that the closer that you come to the fifth dimension, the more even that all that are the aspects of human nature, of nature itself, of the darker aspects of personality or self, selfless, selfish, self-full, all of these 
are to be examined and as much as possible explained. And in essence, that is what humanity is wishing to do with itself. It is attempting to explain its world to itself. And of course, the world is made up of many things. Those that are seen, those that are unseen, those that are seldom or sometimes seen, and those that only some beings can see and others not. Because, as you know, those things that are invisible to some are quite visible to others. The unreal is real, depending upon who will explore the subject. And so, again, to take the subject far into the distant past, as we are known to do in some of our explorations, I have said to you that this subject is considered upon other worlds as well, but we will leave those aside, and we will, of course, dedicate ourselves only to how humanity and those of ancient times have related to this subject. Every particular nation, every particular history, every culture has its own variation of the stories of the dead or the walking dead or those that are simply dearly departed. And of course, some of these have now fallen into the time of myth. In fact, most have. But here and there we will touch upon the reality or the historical aspects and how they came to be known or woven into your history as well. Indeed, comes then from the ancient times, the most ancient that we will say are those of the temple schools of the Babylonian. And those then understood that there was a change of the seasons, just as you do now. But in those times, they believed more in two seasons, the lighter season and the darker season, or the growing season, or the sleeping season. And the sleeping season was at times as well considered when all things appeared to be dead. Now, among the educated, of course, there was much of an understanding of how all things grow and regenerate and move through a variety of cycles. But among the less educated, that was not the case. When something was not growing, it simply appeared to be dead. Not dormant, not regenerative, simply dead. And so that is how they came to wish to please either the gods or even those who were the most educated among them who would then come and show how to regenerate a seed or how to bring the proper amount of water or sunlight and to teach the uneducated. And of course, those that wish to have themselves held in high regard, in high esteem, well, they would make certain to come about at a time when the season was just about to come forward, when it was just about to spring back into life. And of course, there it seemed that they would do their magic and so to impress others. And at the very least, they would be given a parcel of land or held in high regard or some benefit that would come to their nature. In these particular times came different gods, as you well know from your own historical perspective, Arishkigal in that time, known also as the sister of Ishtar, also had a counterpart. And this particular symbol of nature was known during the non-productive season, during the dormant season. And so in the Babylon, then, there was a doctrine that allowed for two kingdoms, one of this world or the living world and one of the world beyond or the world of the dead. And it was thought that there were indeed two
two sisters, one from the other, and one was known to bring the plagues, the other was known to bring life. And so here you have the two opposites, one against the other, two sisters thought to rival each other, one that wished to give life to all things, and one that came in the season of darkness or the season of the dead. And of course, there would be what could be done to banish the evil sister from that kingdom and to give all of the accolades to the good goddess. And of course, there were one or two holidays, celebrations, in which there was a reconciliation between light and dark. Certain occasions in which they both shared the honors and they both were known to rule over the land. But of course, one would need to be declared the victor. And so one again had to be banished. And so here, long and long before you have your Halloween activities, your Hollow's Eve and all else, there are indeed certain days of the year depicted or given to moments in which light and dark both exist as one. A certain day, a certain time, when the doors are open, when they are not at odds or at war with one another, and in essence where they have reconciled their differences for the good of all. That is one example that I give to you that began the lore of long and longer ago. Now, of course, we may then take our historic perspective, our journey, and fast forward to the times then that could be called the High Middle Ages at their highest point. And here we would then take our imagery to, well, to Great Britain and to the Western Europe and to Ireland's. And there again came medieval depictions of all types of the living and the non-living of that time. And of course, in those stories, there were common aspects associated to those that walked among the living but were not. And of course, most of those stories had to do with those that were considered wrongdoers, those that could be depicted as wicked or vain, well, or particularly those that also could spread disease and those that were called the unbelievers as well, for this was a common term as well. The unbelievers were those that either did not believe in good or evil, or they did not believe in the good word of the church that was known to bring about the rulership of that time. And of course, to the unbelievers, it was ascribed that those that walked of the dead would come to the unbelievers much more often, or that they would return to the unbelievers in some way and to bring some wrongdoing to them. Most of all, they were known to bring a revenge of one kind or another or any other aspect of plague that could be put upon an unbeliever. The word Ravanan is a very old term as well. The Latin revenir, which means to return. And so here, the original term was not a vampire, but that which simply returns. The word was simply returning. And here in the oldest forms of literature, the walking dead is no more than one that returns, not to avenge their own killer or such, although that was known from time to time as well, but the ones that simply return for their unfinished business. 
Now, among all of the stories that were told as well, those that understood the folklore of it understood that in a time where it was not sanctified to speak of certain terms such as reincarnation, for that was taboo then, it had to come a different way. And so it was explained carefully again to the educated that one returns to complete that which is unfinished. And so it was a way to say, get busy with your life, nose in your own life, work for your betterment, learn your lessons, discover your truths, work compassionately for others. And it was a way to explain the cycle of birth and rebirth. It was a way to explain the seasons, reincarnation, and all of the cycles of the soul. But again, remember that in these times, dark times as well, one needed to hide some of the truths, at least to couch them within other more approved truths. And so those that were said to return was thought of in one circle as the highest, the most important way to rediscover yourself, to complete and then to raise yourself, to raise the unconscious to the conscious. But of course, among those that would not hear of it or those whose indoctrination was too deep, too severe, they indeed interpreted one who returns as one who rises up, as the church would say, to rise up the dead, to eat the living. Well, there came some of your oldest terms, and there came some of the great separations between dark and light as well. Of course, this is a term or a battle, the battle of the skies, the battle between the living and the unliving, the battle of light and dark, consciousness and unconsciousness. All of this is an ongoing one, an ongoing debate that plays itself out in many different ways. And again, I bring this topic to you now for levity for we explore all of the different sides of it as well. But it is more than that. Remember that I have greeted you and that I have told you that as you move closer to the dimensional gateways, for you are almost near the threshold now, you will begin to see these threats rise again. Threats of potential plagues, threats of those who carry them. Do they come from a certain culture? Do they come from a certain belief or lack of belief? Is it true? Is it untrue? Who is a carrier? And even to those, I will tell you, that follow the more scientific truths, even those will say there are some with an advanced case of this or that a DNA that is capable of expanding and one that is not. You see, even from science and from all of the different frontiers, you will begin to see what can be ascribed or fall under the umbrella of this topic. And so we explore it here from a different vantage point, you see. I could easily have brought the subject to you and said, look here, we will speak of plagues and we will speak of dimensions and we will again speak of the 2012 and what comes. Oh, but some of these terms have been so overused, would you not agree? And so here we have a very different exploration, one that is current, one that is woven into your culture, again, of believers and non-believers. And you will notice, of course, that the youth among you, oh, how taken they are with the subject. Have you noticed it? How taken they are with the new folklore. You see, they are not as interested in the old. They have a new version of it now. And you see, this is how they are teaching themselves about dark and light, about who to trust, 
and who not to trust about hidden powers of how to cultivate that power, of how to free yourself from overlords or over power. You see, they are teaching themselves how to disarm those that seem to hold power or reign over them. And you will see that in their own way, they are teaching themselves and perhaps you about sovereignty, about truth, about the eternal quality of goodness, of nature, of how to be a leader rather than a follower, of how to surround yourself with certain force fields that God or a light, of how to trust in the invisible and how to manage that which appears out of nowhere. Can you begin to see the importance of some of the lessons? Can you begin to see some of what is hidden beneath a simple story or an epic followed by the youngsters? This is the way. This is the way that your culture goes about the same myths, the same stories of long ago, retold, reinvented, reimagined, and in their own way made real. Because, yes, that which is invisible is visible to many, particularly to the younger ones. They see what you do not. They see that which is more obvious than you do, and they see that which is more subtle than you you do, for the most part, because their range is beyond yours, their hearing a little bit different, their vision a little bit different. Of course, by your own scales, if you were to measure their auditory tones or their 20-20 eyesight, you could apply the same measure. But if you would take finer instruments, you would see that their depth they are truly able, some of them, to see a bit more dimensionally than you are. A bit more depth of four field. They are able to see. They are able to control. And they are able to make manifest within a certain field that which is active. In other words, they can separate activate molecules and atoms so that they can dance or that they can be excited in more ways so that their abilities to bring forward, to manifest of the nothingness, something is already active. And their interest in these subjects is bringing that about even more than it has been. And so that is an aside for you to consider can you also do what the younger generations can? To some degree, there are few that can. If you can summon these abilities and strengths, you will know that you can. And with some practice, there are those that can do so more than others. But even those that cannot, it is not that all is lost. For you will see that of the younger ones, as it becomes more and more common, more and more common, their abilities, it will be contagious in its own way, viral, you could say, so that some of those of the next generation, those most proximal to them, they are the ones that can be brought into their realm of understanding. Now, to go back in time a little as we move forward and backward of the subjects, here we will say then that of those that began thinking of the darker arts or of what those that had perished were able to do, of course you did not have the forensic sciences that you have today. And there were many that had perished by wrongdoing, by murder, 
by foul play of one kind or another, and much of this went unstudied or unpunished. And, of course, the very guilt that some lived with consumed them. And so, in essence, they drew not upon the light to forgive or to bless or to allow. Their own guilt brought about an essence of their own being, what you could imagine to be an etheric double that was of their darker nature, to then instill within them guilt so that they would then release themselves from that while in life rather than after their life. So their own soul, for their benefit, manifested a darker side of them to plague them, to haunt them, to speak to them in their dream time, in their waking time, again, so that they would take consummate advice from themselves so that they would liberate themselves, bring forward a truth and not carry it into another dimension or another life. Sometimes the soul was successful in this, sometimes it was not. And when it was not, and the being then terminated their life, part of them, that part that was considered guilt or at fault or dark, sometimes because of its density, it did not stay as closely associated with the lighter aspects of them. In essence, you may think of it as the comet's tail. It simply lagged a little bit behind the light that transitioned into the next world, and so the denser aspect of that stayed a little bit longer to see if it could complete something of itself before following into the next dimension. Of course, from here you may extrapolate that we could, if we would, go to explore what you would consider a ghost or a poltergeist, but we will not take it there, not in this speaking, but we have enough to concentrate upon with this topic, and I do not wish to deviate from the original thought that inspired the topic. In either case, when it was that the bodies, the corpses, were then buried, and of course, remember again that we have said that they did not have the benefit of the science that you understand now, or how to properly prepare a body, a corpse for burial. In many times, this was very rudimentary. And so, because of this as well, where they were buried at times was not always consecrated land or graveyard and such. And there was the need to unbury and to bury again. Well, when these corpses were unburied at times, a variety of aspects to their appearance could be noted at times. Now, you must understand that depending upon where a corpse is buried and in what particular vessel it is buried in what particular soil, the very composition of the soil, its mineral content, the temperature, its moistness, and many other factors have to do with how quickly or over how long a period it will decompose. In fact, if at all, and so at times then, when they were exhumed, sometimes the appearance of the body was rather, well, a little bit more plump than expected, and sometimes it did not even show signs of decomposition. There are reasons for this as well, very particular reasons. For instance, when a body begins to leave its signs of life behind. There are many gases that are in the body, 
and they begin to accumulate, particularly in the torso. This begins to increase certain pressure within the body cavity, which will also then of necessity force blood to rise up into the upper part of the body and at times some small or a larger amount of blood may have come from the nose and then even from the mouth. As you might imagine, when these poor corpses were then exhumed, looking very fresh and almost radiant, depending again upon the soil, and with a little bit of blood to color the lips or the nose, that is part of your history there associated with the vampire art. And there I give to you a very simple definition. Now, of course, even those that were of a thinner nature at times, if their bodies would swell, they could appear to be very plump. They appeared to be very well fed. And so then came the wrong assumption that they had fed on blood. And to add to that, there are some, of course, when these gases were trapped in the corpse, even a groan-like sound <laughs> could be known to come forward past the vocal cords. And oh, did that not send many a grave robber running? And why not? And why not? For those that have been the robbers of old, well, did they not deserve a little scare here and there? Perhaps yes. Now again, if we are to speak of blood, there are many, many cultures, ancient cultures, that have been known to celebrate with a drop of blood, a prick of the finger, or other blood arts. And even those that you now celebrate, those of the Maya, those that lived in great temples and that are known for many, many great feats of construction, mathematics, those that are upheld today as ones that you would wish to emulate, they too had their own ceremonies that at times involved bloodletting. And so the blood is something that is sacred and consecrated to humanity. It is something that is the cup of life. It is something that is known to give birth, to give the flowers of life, the flowing waters of life, and even in death, as you can see. And so you see, this way to celebrate is also known as that which brings fear. Again, always the known and that which gives life and that which appears to take life. The celebrations that you now enjoy that have more to do with sipping of wine, these are derivations of long and long ago that began from the blood. And so this also is a part of of all that is of your history and all that is of the mysteries as well. Of course, folklore would add to this other aspects as well. Imagine that there was anything at all to do in a small village that had to do with any stealing of cattle or sheep or any aspects. This was attributed at times in the darker ages to do with the vampire or the unbelieving or the undead for who wished to admit that their neighbor or their brother had been the very thief. And so here you have some of the myth associated with this as well. Then many different forms of paralysis that were known at that time as well, precursors to what you would consider polio and other forms of paralysis, they would wake this way. And it was said that those that had walked among them before had come back in the night, pressed themselves so close to life in order to catch the breath of the sleeping that they paralyzed or deadened the body of some. 
So you see, that then brought rise to what could be called an apotropaic. This is the practice of celebrating the mundane item, even the sacred item. Here is where you have the branch of wild rose, the hawthorn plant, the garlic, the holy water, all of this celebrated between regions and religions to ward off evil, to protect a house with mustard seeds, with any other aspects, a crucifix, a rosary, all this then came to be understood, and all other inventions that were given to the different regions, including crossing that which is a burning bush, crossing that which is running water, and more. So, in our own way here, we are traipsing through history, bringing to you a bit of the historic that has accuracy, and noting the folklore and how it came to be as well. The reason to note this is that your culture, this culture, this time, will make its own stories, and in some ways they are already being fashioned. It may seem to you that the popularity of the myths that are currently being brought forward, it is but a movie here, it is but a storyteller there, but you see how spellbinding they are. You can see by the very popularity that myths are being born again. And that is why it is important to take note of this subject and of others that will come about as well. It is the time for new mythology. You see, many of the older ones, they are coming obsolete now. They have been ruled out by science. They have been set aside by religion or by those that have brought about a more historic accuracy now. But the world lives by mythology and creates its new world based upon the myths of the heavens and the earth. And so, as the new world is about to be birthed, there are some myths that are being set aside. But the more of them that are set aside, the more that, in essence, wish to come forward must come forward. I bring this to your awareness because you may work with your conscious and your unconscious to establish for yourself a certain myth reality that works for both of them, for both of you. Do not allow as much as possible that you can so much separation between light and dark, right and wrong, integrity or its lack. Do not allow yourself to place blame upon those that have not figured out for themselves that there is another way yet. It is not to say that you are to celebrate or uphold wrongdoing, but there is a place within you that can weave it together. And the more that you weave it together into one garment, you will see that it is light and dark, shadow and shade that give texture to your life, that give a reality to your being, and that will give you a certain courage to rediscover all of your aspects. Do not turn on all of the switches to light and ignore all of the others, because in essence, well, just as a panel... It might overload your circuits to devote yourself so much to this and not to that. If you will gaze at the sun, then gaze at the moon as well. If you will look to the light of blue skies, then look in the dark night and see for the most distant stars as well. Do not allow yourself to fall only one to the other. And so you see, we explore a subject here that brings to you another aspect of nature, another aspect of your beingness and of your truth. Here, in essence, we are exploring your unconscious, not your subconscious, 
the unconscious a very powerful ally in your life. Your unconscious is very interesting to your soul. Your soul works with your unconscious. In some ways, it is much more studious than your conscious mind. The more that your conscious mind seeks to attain in terms of information and guidance and do this but not that and steer clear of the other and here is a new teacher and a new book, your unconscious is only interested in following the very next natural step for you. It is in tune with nature. It is in tune with all of the lifetimes that you have ever had. It is in tune with your sleep state, your dream state, your consciousness. It is not simply the opposite, or it is not that which opposes your natural self or your awakened self. Your unconscious self is your ally. It holds your greater truths. It is more neutral. It is more balanced. And in its own way, it is much more awakened than what you believe is your consciousness. So I bring this topic to you. I reveal it to you. I present it to you for your consideration. Of course, the mythology will stay just where it has, the folklore and the older stories, a bit for your entertainment, but a little bit as well to trigger the unconscious to remember, to remember its own way to create, to unravel, to unravel the old so that it can then weave the new and the next into this particular life. Again, I tell you that in this next cycle that you are just entering now, matter of fact, this year, your 2010 year, brings that cycle forward. It is a time in which light will define itself. Truth will enlarge itself. And some of which is more true than you can imagine is also a little bit more unreasonable than you might imagine. You have waited for a very long time for explanations and for truths to come forward. And of course you have heard it said that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. I will confirm that for you. So while your mind is attempting to make order out of the chaos of this time, when certain truths come forward, your mind will wish to order them, to sequence them, to make them appropriate in your logical and linear world. But you will see that it does not always come together in this way. You will see that instead it has a dimensional quality. Truth will rise to the surface. It will be spontaneous at times. It will spark as if from the invisible you will see a spark. A spark of life, a spark of hope, a spark of truth. And sometimes that spark will have come out of nowhere, out of a past image, out of a modern myth, out of something that is only now beginning to create itself. So we are speaking here of the unbelievers becoming believers. And in some cases, they will be you. As much as you would consider yourself a believer, I can believe this, I can believe in that. It is what I have worked for. It is what I believe in, you will see. But there will come moments where you say, I did not believe it would come about that way. Or I can believe this much, but not that far. And in those moments I will say, go a little bit further, a little bit longer, a little bit deeper. And you will see that I will accompany you in those moments. So, sweet ones, until the next moment, explore, discover, reunite, invigorate yourselves. And I will endeavor to do the same 
and to bring to you such topics as will tickle, tantalize, and coax forward aspects that on your own you would perhaps not consider. Until the next times, I bid you good day. <laughs>